Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank all the organizers for inviting me to come to the conference. Uh, there's been a, everything's been fantastic, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, also, as was mentioned this morning, we didn't know until recently we were speaking to a, a more public audience, so I've tried to make my presentation accessible, but there's still some things that uh, I'll try to, to talk through. Okay, so the things I'm going to talk about today is, is not about the moral permissibility of interrogational torture, which I've written about um, in other publications. I, I, after going through the first few sessions, I wish I would have thought something to say about this, because I've noticed that all of the presentations so far have been on the same side of the debate. So we were supposed to ha we're, spo we're having this forum here at the University of Sao Paulo, but no one yet has defended the permissibility of torture in any sort of circumstances. And I think that even if you disagree with the position, I think it's important to, to see what the arguments are. So I wish I would have thought to talk more about that, but maybe some of it will come up through in my um, other comments. So what I want to talk about today is, um, is about ticking time bomb cases. And I'm a philosopher, so this is uh, certainly a philosophical topic. But I'll, I'll try to make some comments about the application I think these topics have to real world um, discourse. So I want to talk about the methodology and the logic of ticking time bomb cases. I want to talk about the features that these cases have. And I want to talk about some of the impact that those features have on uh, the torture debate. And I should say from the outset that ticking time bomb cases need not have anything to do with bombs. This, we frequently talk about ticking time bomb cases, uh, particularly uh, in regards to terrorism. But the, the, the salient features of the ticking time bomb cases, which I'll characterize uh, shortly, need not have any necessary connection to those sort of applications. They could also have applications uh, in uh, police cases, uh, particularly in regards to kidnapping, where we have the same sort of structural features that we'll see in the ticking time bomb case. OK, so there's four things that I want to, uh, to go through today. First, I want to look at some of the history regarding ticking time bomb cases, as well as some of the features that those cases share with each other. Second, I want to consider the link that these cases and these arguments um, have to consequentialism moral theory. So consequentialism moral theory, of which utilitarianism is uh, the most obvious candidate, holds that um, actions are right or wrong in terms of what they do, in, in terms of the consequences they have in the world, specifically um, pleasure and pain. And in the literature, and, and even through the seminar, there's been an assumption that these cases are uh, intrinsically utilitarian, or, or wholly utilita utilitarian. And I want to argue against um, that assumption. Um, third, I've run uh, a study in the United States and in Australia, and I want to present the results from that study. Um, and, and following from those results, I want to look at what I think the implications that those results have uh, for the debate over torture and the ticking time bomb dialectic. OK, so ticking time bomb cases in the philosophical literature have played a, a, a dominant role. And some critics think this is, this is an, they played an unfortunately dominant role. One thing that makes ticking time bomb cases interesting is not just the role they've played in the philosophical literature or the legal literature, um, but also in uh, in the public literature, particularly in the United States and I would assume in other countries as well. So unlike many things that philosophers talk about, these sort of cases really have been exported into um, public consciousness. So I want to start with one of the classical formulations of the ticking time bomb case, of which uh, there are at least two others. The reason I picked this one, it was written by a philosopher and it was published in a popular magazine, Newsweek, uh, in the United States. There have been a couple other um, instances of ticking time on cases before this, including Professor Shu, who spoke last night, um, and another one that was earlier in the 1970s. So let's just go through the case and then we'll think about the features that it has. And I promise the translator that I'll speak slowly. Suppose a terrorist has hidden an atomic bomb on Manhattan Island, which will detonate at noon. Suppose further that he is caught at 10 o'clock AM, but preferring death to failure, will not disclose where the, the location of the bomb. What do we do? If we follow due process, wait for his lawyer, arraign him, millions of people will die. If the only way to save those lives is to subject the terrorist to the most excruciating possible pain, what grounds can there be for not doing so? I suggest that there are none. 
So I think that this formulation uh, is an exemplar of the, the way that these cases are talked about in, in the literature, both academic and popular. And again, written in a popular magazine to start with. Okay, so now I want to go back to a philosopher, Jeremy Bentham, who was one of the central founders of utilitarianism, the moral theory, who wrote explicitly about torture in the late 1770s, before he laid out his moral theory, which came shortly thereafter. And in this writing, Bentham laid out a series of what he called rules, which uh, I think reflect a lot of the, the central features of ticking time bomb cases. So what I'm doing in this part of the talk is I want to look at the ticking time bomb cases and to draw the analogies between those cases and utilitarian thinking, which I'm then going to go on to challenge later. So the project in, I'm sorry, so first the rules that Bentham has regarding torture. And again, is one classic founding member, classic founder of utilitarianism. He lists several rules of which I'll only mention some of, I think, the most important. So he says, torture should not be applied without near certainty that the would-be tortured has the relevant knowledge. And this is intuitive. We're not, we, we shouldn't torture people uh, who we don't have any reasonable expectation, have any knowledge that would be of any use to us. Um, second, he says that torture is only appropriate as a last resort given the presence of imminent threat. Again, this sounds right. If there are other avenues we can explore other than torture, such as dialogue or trying to find um, other, pursuing other intelligence leads, then we should certainly do so before we torture. Third, he says that minimal means should always be preferred to extreme means. Again, if you're going to torture someone, of which it's still an open question whether you ever should do, at least minimally, you, no matter what, you should always apply the minimal means necessary uh, to get to, to accomplish your goal, right? You, shouldn't, you, know, you don't need to torture more than is minimally necessary. And fourth, uh, he says the benefits, the prospective benefits must be greater than the prospective costs. So the only reason torture would ever be appropriate is if there's something to be gained that exceeds the costs, and we can talk later about what the costs are going to be, the cost of the torture. So subjugating a lot of people to torture to save uh, an empty field from being blown up would, would not be appropriate because the, the benefits do not outweigh the costs. Okay, after Bentham worked on torture, uh, a couple years later, he developed what he called the hedonic calculus. Um, and the hedonic calculus was the means to try to figure out, as a utilitarian, which features are relevant to making decisions about how we should act. And Bentham thought that there were seven features that we must consider as utilitarians when deciding uh, which actions are right or wrong. First, he thought we should consider the intensity of pleasures. So more intense pleasures, all else equal, are better than less intense pleasures. Second, he said we have to consider duration. Pleasures that last for a long time are better than pleasures that uh, are less temporally extended. Third, we should consider certainty. Pleasures that are certain to be realized are better than pleasures of, on which we have a more attenuated uh, chance of grasping. Fourth, propinquity, which just means nearness. Bentham thought that the pleasures that were closer to us, that, were more, that we'd be able to realize in shorter periods of time, were more valuable than those that were more uh, temporally distant. Uh, fifth, fecundity. The idea here is that, the pleasure, that pleasures that lead to other good pleasures are better than pleasures that don't. So we're trying to figure out what things to pursue. We should pursue things that lead to other good things uh, as opposed to things that don't. Relatedly, we should not pursue things, we should not pursue actions that lead to bad things happening. Um, we'd, rather have, we'd rather pursue actions that don't have negative consequences than that do. And finally, extent. So now we take all of the first six features that Bentham laid out, and we have to think about how those would affect every single person who would be affected by any course of action that we might have. So these were the seven features that he thought were relevant to, to figuring out how the utilitarian should act. Okay, now I want to, uh, to go through those features and look, at, <laughs> and look at ticking time bomb thinking and see how those features are, uh, it would seem, built into the case. So the first two he talks about are intensity and duration. Um, this is an implicit feature of the case, uh, and it, the upshot is that 
for every life that you save, you're, it, so long as these lives are worth living, these people will now go on to have valuable experiences, and all of those experiences matter, both in terms of how intense they are and how long they last. Certainty. This, this is very important in ticking time bomb cases, so I want to spend a minute on it. In the ticking time bomb case, everything is certain. It's certain that you have a terrorist. It's certain that you know you have a terrorist. It's certain that if you torture the terrorist, he'll tell you the location of the bomb. It's certain that if you know the location of the bomb, you'll be able to get to it and you'll be able to deactivate it in time such that people's lives are saved. All of those features are, um, are, are certain in the ticking time bomb cases. Critics, of course, are going to say that, that the, the problem is none of those things is certain in real life, which is a point to which we'll, we'll return. Fecundity and purity. In the ticking time bomb cases, when you torture, the, the consequence is supposed to be that you save lots of lives and you, you get all of the benefits that those lives would have had. And the ticking time bomb cases as constructed have no negative consequences, right? You torture and you get the good things, the, the saved lives and all of the things that would have resulted from that, and nothing bad happens. We'll go back to the nothing bad happens part shortly. Finally, extent. In ticking time bomb cases, it's, it's all, almost always the case that hundreds of lives are saved or thousands of lives or millions of lives. So extent plays a prevalent role in that lots of people are affected vis-a-vis -vis all of these other considerations. Okay, so there's, there's two obvious ways to object to uh, the, the features delimited in these cases. Um, they're, and they're going to be the ones of certainty, which we'll return to later, and the issues of purity, which I want to talk about right now. Okay, so the, remember what the, the feature of purity held that good th that, that pleasures, the, the good things that led to bad consequences were, were problematic. And in the ticking time bomb case, we have the good things happening, um, namely that lives are saved and, and experiences are therefore enabled, but we don't have any bad things happening. Okay? And various critics in the torture debate have, have seized upon this perceived shortcoming of ticking time bomb cases and pointed out that, in point of fact, there's lots of bad things that would happen if we had torture. And this list is not comprehensive, and, and the authors cited are by no means comprehensive either. So let's just look at some of the features that people, the negative features people have pointed out to uh, when we talk about um, practicing torture. First, people have said that torture would have to be institutionalized, that it couldn't just be practiced uh, in sort of a one-off way, uh, but it would have to be, it would have to have some sort of institutional structure that would have costs, both social and economic. Um, second, these, some, some different people go on to say that such institutionalization would have negative costs for liberalism in a free society, which is part of the sentiment driving the, um, this seminar. I also I tried to pick my colleagues who are here at this, who are, many of them who have said these things who are here at the seminar, so I'm referencing them. Uh, third, people have said that if we torture uh, our enemies, it would be more likely that our enemies would torture us, and that would, of course, be ne have negative consequences, at least for um, our soldiers. Uh, fourth, uh, the torturer clearly must suffer as well. In the, tor in the ticking time bomb case, there is no reference made to the impacts that torture has on the torture himself. And my colleague, Dr. Wolfendale, has studied this extensively. Uh, fifth, it's been argued that if we start torturing, then we'll be more likely to perpetuate other wrongs as well. That torture will lead to us doing, uh, committing murder or going to war more often or other such things. Okay, so this, this list again is supposed to uh, enumerate some of the bad things that might happen if we started torture, if we, if we had torture. Okay, and I'm, I'm not convinced by this list. So what I want to say regarding this list and other lists like it is that the, the features that people point to, uh, as we saw in the previous slide, are precisely ones that are excluded by stipulation in ticking time bomb cases. The ticking time bomb cases say, either explicitly or implicitly, that none of those things happens, right? So even if we recognize the moral force of the considerations that are invoked, um, it doesn't follow that we couldn't torture in, in, in limited cases where none of those features is in actuality realized. None of, enumerating forces that don't, sorry, enumerating features that don't apply in those cases has no moral force in those cases. And those are the ones that I want to have under consideration right now. Now, 
The next, the next move in the dialectic from the, critic, from the critic is to say, well, that's fine. Now you've constrained yourself to this uh, limited set of scenarios which will never be realized in, in real life. Okay, so two things. Uh, first, as a matter of, of moral philosophy, I still think it's, it's important to explore this. But secondly, I'm less pessimistic than some of my friends that the features germane to taking time bomb cases are not, in fact, realized in limited cases um, in the real world. Okay, so we, we, can, we can return to that to, to discuss later. I'm sure lots of people are going to disagree. But now I want to return to the details of the case and to try to evaluate some of the logic and methodology of these ticking time bomb cases. I've already pointed to what I think arguably are two problems uh, internal to the logic of ticking time bomb cases. I don't think purity is a problem because those things are ruled out. Nevertheless, I think there's two other things which, which are important. Um, or which are at least conspicuous. First is the alleged dependence of ticking time bomb cases on utilitarian thinking. Okay, this, is, this, this assumption, which has never been argued for, is ubiquitous in the literature on torture. Um, and I think it's false. And I'll talk about why. Second, uh, the ticking time bomb cases have high degrees of idealization. Um, and the idealization that I'm most interested in this case has to do with the certainty features, that we know we have a terrorist, that we know the torture will be efficacious, that we know we'll get, we'll get actionable intelligence, that we know the intelligence will allow us to uh, diffuse the threat in a timely fashion. Okay, and critics say it just never works like that in the real world. Um, again, I'm not sure I agree, but I don't think that it matters. Um, so I'm going to challenge the first one. I'm going to challenge the, de the dependence of ticking time bomb thought experiments on utilitarian thinking, and I'm going to deny that the idealization is uh, significant for reasons I'll explain shortly. Okay, so, how, so the way that I'm going to pursue this is with some colleagues, I designed four thought experiments which varied along two dimensions, guilt and innocence and certainty and uncertainty. So you can put these together in, um, in the following matrix. And what, I, what I want to explore is whether, um, I want to explore whether the, the subject of the torture is guilty or innocent, whether that makes a difference. And I also want to explore whether the, which goes directly to the, the, the link between ticking time on cases and utilitarianism, because guilt and innocence are not constructs that utilitarianism can readily accommodate. I don't think it can accommodate them at all. You could try to have some more attenuated story. But it's at least not immediately obvious how, you, how consequentialism uh, is going to accommodate those sorts of features. Second, I want to look at the certainty-uncertainty dimension and see, uh, see how that affects moral judgments in ticking time bomb cases. Uh, the reason the certainty-uncertainty is going to matter is because the, the, all of the certainty built into ticking time bomb cases gets directly at the issue of idealization. The, all of the certainty parameters are idealizations uh, as against the real world. So you can take the two dimensions and you can put them together in the following ways, uh, and you have four different uh, cases that you would try to explore. Okay, so I wrote surveys that had, uh, I, wrote ex I wrote cases, which we'll see shortly, that look at these four different cases. Okay, over a thousand different uh, students participated consensually uh, the students each randomly received one of the four cases um, to prevent what we call framing effects, that they would be biased by having seen previous cases. Uh, the response was on what's called a seven-point Likert scale. So we have a sentence at the end of the survey, and then we ask uh, the participants to indicate to what, degree they, to what degree they agree or disagree with that sentence. Uh, also, I recorded gender and the number of philosophy classes students had had. Um, to, to see whether those were had statistically interesting consequences. Okay, and finally, the surveys were administered in two different countries, um, at my university in Michigan and at the Australian Defense Force Academy in Canberra, Australia. And then I also recorded which country the survey was um, taken in. Okay, so again, there, there are four cases and we're going to now have a, uh, we're going to have case, we're going to have, there are four different cases, and we're now going to look at what the cases were. And they're all variants of ticking time bomb cases. Okay, so case one, 
Um, and I'll only read the first part once because it's going to be the same throughout. Um, imagine you've just apprehended a terrorist who's responsible for planting a bomb in a crowded metropolitan center. The bomb squad has been unable to defuse the bomb, and unless the terrorist provides the deactivation code, it will detonate and kill 100 people. Okay, second part. You, which could mean the law, local law enforcement, has exhausted all other possibilities and must now contemplate more extreme measures. If the terrorist is subject to moderate torture, then he will surely provide the deactivation code for the bomb in time for its safe deactivation. Now, with the colors, I, I match them up. So the guilt at the top, which is in red, matches if the terrorist is subjected to moderate torture. Um, certainty matches the blue part. He will surely provide the deactivation code for the bomb. And on the next cases, we'll see how that gets changed. Okay, now the question. On the following scale, please indicate the degree to which you disagree or agree with the following sentence. It is morally permissible to torture the terrorist. And now uh, this, the respondents picked a circle between strongly disagree and strongly agree. Okay, so that's case number one. Case two. Now everything is the same, except I changed the part on the previous slide where it said he will surely provide the deactivation code for the bomb in time for its deactivation. Now I changed that to there is a 1% chance that he will provide the deactivation code for the bomb in time for its safe deactivation. <coughs> Excuse me. However, there's a 99% chance that torture will accomplish nothing and that all the lives will be lost. Again, indicate your agreement or disagreement with the following sentence. It's morally permissible to torture the terrorist. So all that's changed is the certainty condition. The, instead of torture certainly working, it is, it is now uncertain that torture will work. I also changed the number of lives that would be saved from 100 to 10,000. And that's so I could have the same expected outcome because I have only a 1% chance that the torture will work. So the expected outcome will be 1% times 10,000, which is 100, which is what it was on case number one. OK, case three. Now I'm going to change the guilt. So now instead of torturing a terrorist, I'm going to torture someone who's innocent, namely, in this case, his daughter. So everything else is the same, and then except for the red part. Now instead of saying if the terrorist is subjected to moderate torture, it says if his daughter is subject to moderate torture, then he will surely provide the deactivation code in time for its safe deactivation. Also, the sentence at the bottom is changed. Now it says it's morally permissible to torture the terrorist's daughter, as opposed to it's morally permissible to torture the terrorist. Okay, fourth case, we put these together. Um, now we're torturing the innocent daughter, and it's not certain that this will work, right? So if the daughter is tortured, then there's a 1% chance that uh, the lives will be saved, 99% chance that nothing will happen. Okay, so these are the four cases which, again, vary along the two dimensions of guilt and innocence, certainty and uncertainty. Okay, so let's look at the results. Average responses by case. Okay, so again, it was a seven-point scale. One is the torture that they strongly disagree that torture is permissible. Seven, strongly agree that torture is permissible. Case one was where you're torturing a terrorist, and it would certainly work. Case two, torture terrorist probably won't work. Case three, torture daughter will certainly work. Uh, case four, torture daughter, uncertain that it will work. Okay, and you can see uh, what the results were. Okay, now, for the analysis, what I did was I took the guilty ones and the innocent ones, and I combined them. So in cases one and two, you were torturing the, the, the terrorist. In cases three and four, you were torturing the daughter. And then average the responses in each of those cases. So when you were torturing someone who was guilty, the terrorist, whether it's certain or uncertain that the torture will work, average response 4.92, which is above, which is in, in somewhere in the torture being permissible range. Uh, torture innocent daughter 3.57, exactly in the middle, right? It was a seven-point scale. So uh, if if it's innocent, you don't have support one way or the other. People are on average neutral. Okay, now this is a statistically significant result. We can talk more later about what that means if if we want to. But uh, not, I mean, outside the statistics, what it means is that 
it matters when you're looking at people's moral judgments in ticking time bomb cases whether you're torturing a terrorist who is guilty or whether you're torturing a daughter who is innocent, which intuitively, right, should be obvious. Okay, so, uh, I'll go back and talk about the, what I think the implications of this are shortly. Next, certainty and uncertainty. So here I did the same thing. I, co I collapsed the studies together. So in, cases, in case one, you're torturing the terrorist, and it would certainly work. Case three, you torture the daughter, and it certainly works. So I averaged those two together, 4.35. Again, still support for torture, over 1,000 people. Uh, and average here are the uncertainty cases. Case two, tor torture terrorist, uncertain that it works. Case four, daughter, uncertain that it works. 4.16. Okay, this is not a statistically significant difference, right? It doesn't matter, okay, when you're looking, when it doesn't matter when you're trying to analyze moral judgments whether there was certainty or uncertainty in the cases. That was not a statistically significant driving factor in people's moral judgments, whether it's 100% that it would work or 1% that it would work. Okay, now we go to gender. Um, men were more likely than women to think that torture was permissible. Men across all cases and, and all countries, 4.54, women 3.89. Um, okay, this was statistically significant, right? It mattered who was responding, whether they were males or whether they were females. And again, I'll do some of the analysis shortly. Um, with the gender one, also, in every single case, all four, the males were more likely than the females to think that torture was okay. Okay, so now some comments about um, the... I'm going to talk first about the, the, the gender and the nationality, and then I'll make the more important conclusions, I think, about the other features. Um, males, on average, were more likely to think females, uh, more likely than females, males were more likely to think torture was permissible than females were. Um, okay, well, what, what, what are the implications this has? Some people have studied differences in moral intuitions between men and women. Um, and part of this literature is responsive to Lawrence Kohlberg's work in the late 70s and, and early 80s. And he developed these stages of, of moral development. And then some feminist thinkers have argued against this sort of approach to moral development because Kohlberg didn't make any distinctions between gender. He had everyone developing the same way. So Carol Gilligan, uh, in a famous uh, work, argued that, in fact, men and women have different moral orientations. She argued that, women, that males were more likely to be oriented toward justice and rights, whereas females were more likely to be oriented towards what she called care and response. Okay, but what's interesting in our case is where the men were more likely than the women to find torture permissible. And further research has linked females more likely than males toward utilitarian thinking. So this was research by Colby and Kohlberg. Okay, so they said that women were more likely to be utilitarians than men, and uh, this had to do with Gilligan's notion of care and response ethics where women were more likely to care about families and communities than men were. Okay, so if that's right, women were more likely to be utilitarian. But men were more likely to think that torture was permissible. So if all of that's right, then there are important non-utilitarian features driving, the, driving these thought experiments. Because men, who are less likely to be utilitarian, nevertheless are more likely to think that torture is permissible. Okay, next, let's look at differences across countries. This is going to surprise you. United States average response was about four that torture, that the degree of agreement with torture. Australia, however, was nearly a point higher. There could be a reason for this, which I'll mention shortly. Okay, and in, um, in Australia, we saw the same thing, that men, again, were more likely to think torture was permissible than women. Okay, so we did have a statistically significant result here. Okay, Australians were more likely than Americans to think torture was permissible, uh, and this uh, was statistically significant. Okay, but there's, I think there could be a problem with, this, uh, with the data, because the survey was taken at the Australian Defense Force Academy, which is uh, an integrated institution where cadets go in Australia to prepare for military service uh, across to whatever branch of the military they'll go to. So it seems quite plausible that military cadets would be more likely than civilians to support torture. 
Um, maybe they think that in the course of their military operations, it's an important tool, right, that they would like access to. Um, on the other hand, I'm not sure. Maybe they would rather not ha have torture on the table because it would be more likely that their enemies would torture them. In future studies, I want to run uh, this, the study at various American service academies and see how American service academies compare to Australian service academies because comparing Australian service academy to uh, American civilians maybe isn't so good. But one point I'd like to draw here, some, comment, some people that have presented and that will present have argued that military personnel do not want access to torture. And we heard, uh, we heard the recording earlier. But at least in Australia, pretty, the, the response was five out of seven, pretty strong uh, support for the permissibility of torture among Australian cadets in training. Now, it might not follow from that that they want themselves to be able to perpetuate the torture, right? But at least preliminary result, they seem to think it's morally permissible. Um, I'm also interested in the fact that people in different countries responded differently. And there have been some other studies in um, experimental philosophy where uh, we've seen similar uh, differences in cross-cultural intuitions. So that's interesting to me, but not terribly important for these purposes. Okay, but let me return to which I didn't say much about yet, what I take to be the primary conclusions here. Um, this was not, the purpose of this project is not to defend the moral permissibility of torture. Rather, it's to look at, uh, in particular, two criticisms of ticking time bomb methodology. Okay, the, the, the utilitarianism thinking and the, the idealization. Okay, so again, it was taken as a given that the responses in the, 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 the driving force between ticking time by methodologies was utilitarian, okay? And I think that's, uh, I certainly think the consequences matter. And obviously people are thinking about the consequences when they respond in the way that they do. However, they're important, non they're, they're important considerations that are not utilitarian, that are in play. And we saw this in, at least obviously in one case and maybe in another. And the obvious case was where it mattered to people's moral judgments whether we were torturing a guilty terrorist or his innocent daughter. Okay, very different moral reactions. Second had to do with the gender discrepancy. If women were more likely to be utilitarian but less likely to support, I'm sorry, if women were more likely to be utilitarian but in point of fact they're less likely to support torture, thank you then, um, again, there are non-consequentialist features driving moral judgments in these cases. Okay, second, um, regarding the idealizations. There were not significant differences in responses whether the, the torture would certainly work or whether there was a 1% chance that the torture would work. Right? People's moral judgments in those cases were not, we couldn't differentiate among them statistically. Um, so the implications there, to me, are that it doesn't matter that there's this high degree of idealization built into ticking time bomb cases. Again, in the ticking time bomb cases, it's certain you know that you have a terrorist, you know that torture will work, you know that he has the information, you know that you'll get to the bomb in time, you know that you'll be able to disarm it once you get there. Okay, in the real world, it, it probably very rarely, if ever, works that way, right? Rather, none of those things is certain. And if you, could, if you compound these uncertainties together, you get something that's even less certain. Okay, but, <coughs> excuse me. But again, it didn't matter in people's moral judgments whether you had certainty or uncertainty. So the idealizations, as some people have argued in the literature, that the idealizations are unfair because they manipulate people's thinking. It, it doesn't matter. Okay, if you take away the idealizations, at least formally, by relaxing it to 1% chance, People's, react, people's judgments are, you, you can't differentiate them from the cases where you have certainty built in. So the idealizations are not cognitively efficacious. Okay, and that's all. Here are the references. If anybody wants the slides, you can email them. And then I should say I had a lot of people help me with the surveys and the statistics, so I'd also like to thank them. And thank you for coming.